The good news is I'm not expecting, by the way, not even in 20 minutes, this is what you do. It's so, it's so simple. And, and I'm saying this because um, after seven of those examples, I have seven of those examples, you will say, peanuts, it's so easy to do. But it needs, you know, practicing two or three times. And you get it because there is a logic behind this approach. What I want to show you is uh, if you're bipolar, namely the truth versus the relationship. Yeah, we are, no, it's very true. We are, you know, I have a colleague, Charles Hamilton, he's now 77, and he came up with all this dilemma stuff. I said, Charles, after so many years of doing this full time, what is it with human beings uh, that we are so bipolar? He says, it looks like it's designed in our brain. Even the brain, left and right, is, is tearing us apart, right? And it's a reduction of complexity. And I, I believe on top of that, when we had cultures that were kind of separated, half logics, uh, by cho choosing, it's a half a logic, it works. But now we get diverse viewpoints together, it doesn't work anymore. And that's why we had, I think, the last 10 years more crisis than normal situations. Our paradigms are running berserk. And, and, and uh, I'm, the beauty of dilemma reconciliation is you don't have to give up. I'm not asking the American to give up truth and not lie. And I'm not giving... Uh, and, and is there a solution where you both feed the Korean and the American? And I'm saying this in this case. And I'm saying this because that's what the whole workshop is about. It's not lists of Koreans are like this and Americans are like that. Who cares? Because then it's age, then it's gender, then it's discipline, then it's corporate culture. Please, Nadia. Yeah, I think the biggest fear is the misunderstanding. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. How do you get in a way and how would you... Right. It is the interaction between the two cultures and the misunderstanding. That we fear from those. Yes. It happens and we don't we don't accept it. Right. That's another point, and it's perhaps in the action points later on. Put it on the table and don't judge. Say, hey... You seem to like this. We seem to like that. And once you have a corporate culture that allows that, so in other words, you make the respect for other cultures alive by saying, let's put it on the table, you're okay. Right? Now, let me help you. Are, are there uh, individuals who said, yeah, that's clear. This is what we would do. Namely, a solution beyond culture. But le let me help you, if it, uh, because I'm, I'm used to yeah, next time. The problem here is not your lack of answer. The problem here is my question. This, namely, is an MBA question. And you know an MBA question leads to brilliant discussions, but the question is wrong. In a nutshell, MBAs. Brilliant solutions to fundamentally the wrong questions, right? <laughs> now, what is wrong in my question? There is an assumption in my question that is a wrong assumption. Namely, that you can find integrity on a linear line by choosing. You cannot find integrity by choosing between the friend and the truth. If you go to the etymological dictionary, a good tip, by the way, you find that integrity is creating wholeness through the integration of opposites. You say, blah, 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 what is that? Now, what I very often hear in Japan, we, we have... Workshop with Japanese, and the Japanese said, sorry, Mr. Trompenhaus, our option is not on your list. I said, oh, shoot, Japanese, yeah? <laughs> they say, what we would do in Japan is we would test the strength of our friendship by asking our friend to tell the truth in court himself so we can talk to the judge to lower the sentence for his courage. Now, what happened? Instead of choosing between the friend and the truth, you connect the friend to the truth, and that creates integrity. And that's the essence of multicultural management. How can we create a new reality by connecting opposites instead of choosing? Okay? And integrity is where you want to end all the time. Now, first of all, it is always handy to know where the dilemmas are coming from. So in this case, and don't be worried, you have, by the way, in your uh, backpack, I, I, I hate to add another tool, but there is this little blue booklet, and it explains every dimension. Yeah, you, you got it, Bob. Can you hold it up, Bob? Yeah, that, that little thing. 
And it has the seven basic dilemmas between cultures. And the first one, and don't be afraid of the title, universalism versus particularism. Now, let, let me explain. A, universalist, a universalistic culture is about this. Uh, the, the, those are cultures, first of all, who say my friend has no right or some right and I will not help by lying. They believe in systems, standards and rules, procedures. You need it for a good project. But you also need this. And it's part, by the way, of some of the dilemmas you mentioned. You need to be flexible, pragmatic. There are exceptions. It depends. So this is the letter of the law. And this is the, yeah, if you like, the spirit or the interpretation of the law. And it has positives and negative sides. This is consistent and this is flexible. This is bureaucracy and this is corruption. Right? Now, how can you combine the two? Let's first look at our 100,000 database. This is, uh, and we have 55 countries, this is only 25 or so. The top scorer is Switzerland. 97% of the Swiss say, my friend has no right or some right, and I will not help. And as you know, 3% in Switzerland speak Italian. Yeah? Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Italy is not on the chart because PowerPoint can't deal with negative scores, right? But do you now understand why I allow myself to make these jokes? Because the bottom is not better than the top. Although the top says, Mr. Trump, and I thank you for this uh, wonderful research, because I knew, says the Swiss, the Koreans and Venezuelans are corrupt. You can't trust them. They always help their friends. Till I did a workshop in Korea, a Korean came to me and said, Mr. Trump, thank you. I, I knew the Americans are corrupt, and you proved it. I said, what do you mean? You can't trust them. They won't even help their friends. Yeah? <laughs> You see, any value taken to an extreme leads to a pathology, and it makes you laugh. Now, I don't want to fill this in, but at the top are more the people who believe in the universal truth, don't lie, follow the rules, and others say, no, be flexible, it depends, a good relationship, right? That's more the right-hand side. The best question I ever had was an Italian who, who asked, what happened to the car, right? <laughs> uh, the important thing in life. Now, this is just a small little database. Um, I, I can count uh, six, uh, 12, 12, 12 people fill this in. The variety in this room, just one question. Let us give you the meta, the meta dilemma in business. Are you a global company going for global standards? Or are you saying we are culturally diverse? There are 50,000 people working at least representing 20 countries, uh, I say at least because there will be many more, that need different solutions. Now, how do you deal with that? And what I want to do in your mind is crack the line. Crack the line in a dual axis. If you're only global and centralized, this is called the global corporation, right? This is McKinsey Consulting. Uh, they have a three-week workshop for young graduates, which is called How Can I Fake Listening to a Client? Yeah? <laughs> and we have the decentralized multinational that you all play the local game. But the only thing that connects you is perhaps the brand, uh, like KPMG Consulting. In fact, they're all local entities. They're both, both half lame ducks. Now, be very careful for an approach that is called the international project. That is the Statue of Liberty with a local flag. Uh, if you want the Walt Disney Park where they say, okay, we do wine in France, but not in Miami. This is, I think, where you need to go. And that takes time. That's not done overnight. It's called the transcultural cooperation. Now, what, what, let me give you three characteristics of the transcultural cooperation. First of all, it always learns locally, take the best practices, and globalizes them. So if you are in an international project and you see that this is coming from Thailand, and this is coming from the Netherlands, and this is coming from let's say, Jubal itself, and this is coming from America, always say, gee, what is best in software? What is, yeah? And then you say, gee, in, um, in Greece, we found this. Let's make it global. And, and you will see that um, a lot of companies are not, not geared up for that because they say, oh, we, we look for best practices, but it always comes from headquarters. That's not very helpful, okay? 
Second characteristic, the top is diverse. Uh, let me give you one of my favorite companies, Applied Materials. They make machines to make microchips. Top 159 nationalities. Management team, seven people, nine nationalities, because two of them have a double passport. <laughs> right? Now, that diversity helps tremendously, but only with characteristic number three, is their value-driven organization. They have decided it's all nice to be diverse, but this is what we are about. This kind of stuff. Okay? And they have a mission, but they also have a purpose. And the mission is more the hard stuff, and the purpose is the hard stuff. Now, one footnote on that. They have developed values, and you can do it still with this as a framework, that are like yin and yang. So instead of saying we believe in teamwork, they say we strive for teams that consist of creative individuals. We give direct feedback with diplomacy. And we're running a workshop in the Netherlands, a one-year workshop to explain what that means. Yeah? <laughs> and it's, it's not working. Yeah? You get the point? So now you have this as foreground. Yeah? Now I, I think there are areas like safe with security. Don't touch it. <laughs> no other side. <laughs> right? But there might be other values that might contradict your idea of safety a bit, like flexibility. Right? How do you reconcile that? Or how do you make sure it's not a dilemma? And say, here we have to make a choice. Right? That's the, the work you do when you implement this stuff. And you as leaders, my, my point always is start with teams. Implement in teams, because teams are the ones, first of all, that you are responsible for. And it's an entity that you, you know, the corporation, the project. That's now done. The, 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 the role has been played. But within that, translated it to the team where you guide individuals. Transcultural cooperation, uh, there are a few of them. A final characteristic, it very often doesn't have one center. It has multi-centers. Now... This was the introduction plus one example. I want to go quickly now through six other examples. First of all, on the universal particular side, you mentioned many dilemmas. This is your mention. Later on, I'll give you tools to work on those dilemmas with a methodology for after the break. Have a look. These are huge amounts, and in your, uh, let's say, handout, you, you get them all, as I show you here. So these are versions of universal versus particular type of cultural issues. Okay, and you don't have to memorize it, it's fine. <laughs> Another interesting cultural difference is, are you more individualistic or communitarian? How do you recognize it? Very simple. Um, you see it, do people write I with a capital letter and you with a small y? That's very often an individualistic culture. Uh, first and last name. If you start your first name, Peter Johnson, call me Peter. Peter is I, Johnson is the family, you go back. Eh? In communitarian cultures, you start with the family name, then you go to the first name, and you call me by the family name. These are little signs, and we formalized it by a question. We asked A or B. A, obviously, is more individualistic. Eh? Give people as much freedom as possible and the maximum opportunity to develop oneself, everything will be fine, versus no, you have to continuously take care of your fellows. This is the type of stuff you will see. Positive is uh, personal initiative, commitment and cooperation on, on the communitarian side. Egoism, anarchy versus conformism. So there's always positive and negative. My question now is have a look at how the scores are. So you see... Some, it's interesting, Denmark, the Netherlands, obviously socialistic countries uh, score very individualistic. Eh? Have you ever found a socialist who didn't start the sentence with I? Um, USA, no surprise, I would say. And you go here, and it's much more communitarian. But be careful. Uh, Japan, it's the company. India, it's the religious group. Mexico, it's the extended family. Egypt, again, it's about the past. And, and why am I saying this? Uh, because this is just a picture that gives you an insight, but behind every score is a, is a deeper meaning. Uh, for example, very surprising here are the French. Very often the people call the French individualist. 
I never understood that because I, I'm half French myself. We always went to France on vacation and uh, without a caravan uh, because uh, yeah, with the French mother you develop taste quite early. And it was always in August, en août, as they say. Why? They had to invite grand-père, grand-mère, cousin, cousine. The whole bloody family was sitting there discussing French individualism, but always ensemble. All the difficult words about a group, even in English, are French. Right? <laughs> ensemble, entente, esprit de corps, before I forget, ménage à trois. Uh, yeah? <laughs> it's interesting. The French are internally controlled, but very collective. Have you ever been to Club Med? It's a bit like Lagos. You go there once. Huh? And um, <laughs> it, it's kind of interesting because... Um, with, uh, with Club Med, you feel how communitarian, how group-oriented the French are. Everything is done in groups, and they love it. So be careful. I worked eight years with Shell, and my last job in Shell was in HR, and we did an experiment. Eh? That's very often your last job in Shell. And uh, by the way, yeah, yeah, before I forget, I, I, same database, but we said now organize according to function. Have a look. Marketing, sales. Now, these are... Thousands of people for a bar chart. So you know with your st st statistical knowledge that 2% is already a big difference. Um, and you go very individualistic and you engineering. I, I, I loved it. All the engineering people we had, much more group oriented. Interesting. You need to survive by teamwork. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll explain that in a second. One is shell and the other is generic. Yeah. yeah. Let, let's, um, I have it uh, in, in more slides. I'll, I'll show you that in a second. Individual community, that's you. You see a quite, kind of a big spread. Case study. I want you to work on the following. And it, I, I think reward systems are tremendously important in integrating individual and communitarian cultures. We had a, a research site in the north of Amsterdam called KSLA, Koninklijke Shell Laboratorium Amsterdam. And um, we had a polymer research part that went into a joint venture with the Japanese. And the Japanese, after half a year, started to complain about the tremendous individualistic nature of the reward system. And so we said, gee, we uh, have an issue here. We find this is the dilemma. Do we reward individual performance or team cooperation? And that's fine if, if Northwest Europeans, Americans work together, you go for the individual. If the Japanese work together, you go for the group. But if they have multicultural teams, and you will work in multicultural teams, my advice, review, and perhaps you already did that, your reward system, because it creates havoc. Crack the line. If you only go for the individual, this is me, myself, and withholding information. The big problem of individualized bonus systems is why would I share my information to another? The worst, what happened to me, uh, or the, the best example, if you like, was at Wharton. We, we looked at MBAs, and there was an MBA coming out of the library. We had libraries at the time with eight books. And I said, wow, you, uh, that's heavy reading. He said, yeah, tomorrow an exam. I said, tomorrow an exam, eight books? He said, no, 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 it's not for me. It's that other students can't read it. Right? Now, obviously, that doesn't happen in your projects, but it does happen in the corporate life. I, we have a small company, only 20 people, about 11 consultants. And we have a, a person where we ask, because she does a lot of consulting with interesting clients, tell your colleagues a bit what you learned with your client. No way. Now, what we realized is that part, and a large part of, at least in the past, of our reward system is how much business she gets in. And she told me once privately, if I share this to my other colleagues, they will run away with my clients. So your reward systems can go into a pathology. Ask the Japanese what the problem of group bonuses is. It leads to team mediocrity. Be careful for the compromise. It's go for the small team so you piss off all. Think about, can you have a reward system that does the following? That you reward teams for what they do for enhancing individual creativity, and you reward individuals for what they do for the team. 
There's a whole book written about this. This is called, the book is called Co-Opetition. Co-Opetition is you individually compete to better cooperate. You cooperate to better compete. And you have to find your own version of it. So in IBM, they have said for individual salespeople, they can get a bonus on the basis what they have learned with the customer is in the book. Because if you cooperate with the customer, individual sales will go up. So you cannot just go and, uh, and, and sell things that customers don't want, eh, which was the normal attitude of IBM. And um, you cannot uh, hide it amongst your people because you have to make a presentation. And they will vote on you how good your, your effort was. That's a version of competition. What we did in Shell, we said 50% of the variable pay will go to individuals under one criterion. Who's the best team player? And 50% will go to teams, but teams had to make presentations. So uh, let's say it was Mohamed. Mohamed um, had a patent. And this is his team. The team had to explain how he got the patent. And how he was supported in getting that patent. Right? And people were voting. Now again, this is Shell. You do your own thing. But for knowledge management, it's great, because you learn a lot from each other. But you see the difference between either or or and and. Either or is you go for individual or you go for the team. And and is you do a bit of both. But what makes this through through, which is more than and and, is that you connect the two, that the individual has to be connected to the group and the group has to be in, uh, connected to the individual. Okay? Find your own versions of this. And it's, again, I, we were as a company part of KPMG. The biggest problem we found in our work was the reward system. All the rewards were local. So if we had an international client, they said, on whose budget is this coming? Think, think about it. Again, you, you find your own solutions. Uh, this was one of the uh, dilemmas that you raised. Uh, my knowledge is power, and it can be a department, a team, versus, yeah, it's your words. And by the way, a dilemma is always too positive. So the left-hand side needs to be read as something positive, because if it's negative, you just go for the right-hand side. Okay? Now, I want to do two more and we'll have a break. Um, neutral versus affective, don't underestimate it, but it's how much cultures allow you to show emotions. In neutral cultures, you have emotions, but you don't show them. As Southern English people are, are known for that. I very often ask English people, apart from hooliganism and alcoholism, how do you show emotions? <laughs> uh, and they say humor, yeah? And sports. Yeah? And sports and humor in, in the UK lately is very aligned. Now, affective is more Arab, is more Latin. You have emotions, put it on the table. It's okay. It's passion, right? If you work together, it can lead to... We, we, we did um, some work for Unicredit, as you know, a bank in Italy that bought heap of Rhine's bank in Germany. This was the problem. When we interviewed the Germans and the Italians about each other. The Italians said, we're a bit worried about the Germans because they don't show any passion. It looks like they're sleeping. I don't know what it is. Then we interviewed the Germans who said, yeah, Italians, they wave a bit with their hand and they call that leadership, right? <laughs> Stereotypes. But it's, it's how, how do you deal with emotions? Have a look. Straightforward question. In my society, it's considered unprofessional to express emotions overtly. Have a look who people who say, I agree, it's unprofessional. So you see here, you have, now Hong Kong is the full Hong Kong, huh? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Just Hong is. Kong is here. <laughs> okay? You have emotions. Hold it to yourself. You have emotions. It's okay. It's not good, but what makes you a good project manager? Combine. Let's have a look. This is, again... By the way, it, although it was a very small group, and again, many of you get the opportunity to join us, um, but the spread is huge in this group. It's huge. And, and fine, there's nothing wrong with it. The bigger the spread, the more you need people who unite it. Not by choosing, but by combining on a higher level. Now, for example, Myers-Briggs help us to do this kind of stuff. You lift out thinking and feeling, but you crack the line. 
If your emotions and head is always in control, it leads to analysis paralysis. If your heart is in passion, you're the loving neurotic. Great leaders always check what their heart communicates. So, if I looked at the three presentations, it's of a different style. Some are more neutral, but they do it with passion in the background. Others are passionate, and they do it with neutrality at the background. So if you, as an individual leader, have a lot of stories, and uh, let me tell you, use a bar chart. Yeah? If you're kind of the boring guy, use some of YouTube. Right? And you will see the contrast does the work. Because if you're only boring and your slides are boring, and I mean that with a neutral connotation, kind of serious, then people will start snoring. If you're only shouting with one story after another, say, yeah, but what is the point? Right? And great leaders always combine. Now, oh yeah, time, it's cool to be emotional. Have you noticed that this is mass customization, co-opetition? It's cool to be emotional. Are contradictions in terms? Uh, this is the title of a book of Tom Peters, one of those gurus from America. And he said, you know, the problem in America is the glass ceiling. And it's not a glass ceiling. It's a male ceiling. Males have produced a platform where if females hit it in their male game, they start crying. So men can say they don't only get pregnant, they cry on top of it, right? <laughs> and if they break the ceiling, you say, you bitch, you broke my ceiling, right? <laughs> so females in the male game are invited to either be bitches or cry. <laughs> and that's not what we want for two reasons. First of all, females are much better in dilemma reconciliation than men. And we don't allow them to be successful. They, they, especially in America, you know, you, you have to have certain attitudes where we kill the talents of females. And I think it's a pity because they bring something to the party that is very valuable. And by the way, what I'm talking about is the beyond game. It's not the male game. Male is make a choice. Females is combined. And you need both. Right? And in, in fact, the, the morphological, that's a difficult word, but the way our brain works is that in, it, it shows on scans, is that males are much more deeper and active in, you know, either right or left and, and down in the center. And females are, they call that the corpus callosum, eh? the tissue between the brain halves, much more working with females. Now, again, it's like America and Dutch culture. It's, it's normal distributions. Um, a second reason why we should be changing the game, and I'm, I'm doing my best, is that my daughters need a job. Yeah? Uh, there's some work to do. My favorite, specific and diffuse, and I think this is the biggest problem across cultures, and then we have a cup of coffee, and that is, are you analytic, specific, or are you diffuse? It's... All three of you touched on, on, on that. Namely, are you in and know what the trees are about? And do you take distance? You know what the forest is about. And you need both. It's the driving close versus long. Uh, Mohamed, you, you said it as well. Uh, you know, you need, need to take the helicopter to keep the overview. And, and, and that's diffuse. Diffuse is the overview. Specific is what tree is it. And you need both. But it's cultural. And this is the work of Kurt Lewin. Kurt Lewin was a famous German psychologist. After the war, he went to uh, America uh, as a German, and he became a professor at Harvard. Some of you might have read something from him, but, but um, he wrote a lot of articles on his culture shock in America. He said, Americans are amazing. You hardly know them, and they talk to you. Yeah, and they have a name, Charles, and they say, call me Chuck, yeah, type of thing. And um, he said, it's because Americans are like peaches. And we Germans are like coconuts. Now, what is the metaphor about? A peach, as you know, has a lot of accessible flesh with a tough nut in the center. A coconut is hard on the outside, but very soft on the inside. Now, what is that? Let, let's take the American model. This is private, and this is public. Right? When I went to Philadelphia, a good friend, uh, yeah, his name was Bill Roth, he helped me move. And at the end of the day, we were both so tired. I said, Bill, do you like a beer? He turned around, he was already in my refrigerator, right? <laughs> a refrigerator for Americans is public. I mean, for most Europeans, it's close to a rape. What the hell are you doing in my refrigerator? Yeah? 
We didn't have a car. In America, you need my car? Take my car. Have you tried this in Germany? Take my Mercedes? No way. Right? Here's my wife, but leave my Mercedes, okay? Yeah? <laughs> furniture. People move, they leave their furniture in America. Have you tried this in France? It's called antique. It's the old rubbish you can't sell. It's very private. Now, according to Lewin, and I'm exaggerating twice now, this leads to a specific relationship. If I relate to you, you relate to me, cut the crap, what is this about? Fonts, are we married? Yes, what for? Tax deduction, right? <laughs> Even titles. When I got my PhD, I was invited in the faculty club of Wharton, which is kind of a posh environment, and suddenly I was called Dr. Trompenars. I did one st step outside of the university, hello Fonts, same people. Your Fonts outside, your hair doctor inside. That's interesting, that's a specific relationship. In Germany, you're a hair doctor everywhere. You're a hair doctor in academia. You're still a hair doctor at work. You buy a steak at the butcher. Good name, hair doctor. You come home, good name, Frau doctor. And where are the little doctors? And that is the coconut. Now, how do you recognize the coconut? Initially, no relationship. They call you Z and not do. But once you're in, around October, you're in for life. Right? <laughs> I am so... Um, happy you got it. This is the problem when the coconut meets the peach. Okay? We use this model for Shell. In Shell, the Dutch were the peaches and the English were the coconuts. More reserved, a bit, mm -hmm, right? Uh, and the Dutch put everything on the table. So, how does this affect, for example, a meeting? And I think in your project work, this will be one of the big issues, namely, what is seen by one group as, put it on the table, the others say, hmm, let's not discuss it. And this is, for example, explained by this picture, it's called loss of face. Loss of face is making public what is perceived as something private. Right? Now, this uh, recognition of these models, I will come back to that, is a different style of communication. Uh, in the peach, Australia, the Netherlands, Americans, pretty straight to the point. And they say, and don't take it personal. Yeah, we wrote a book, The Seven Cultures of Capitalism. Obviously, you all read it. And the chapter on the Dutch was called, You're an idiot, but don't take it personal. Right? <laughs> That's the point of the arrow. And some take it very personal. Now, this is a big issue. Coconuts very often have a very indirect way of communicating. Why? Because they know so much is at stake. However, once you're in, and let me go, once you're here, like the Germans, they can be very direct. And then suddenly the boss comes in and it's a different style, right? So you see, the Dutch, it doesn't matter if the boss is in or not, they go straight, right? Uh, including the boss, by the way. You're an idiot. Let me tell you why, yeah? Oh, thank you for the input. You really show respect, yeah? <laughs> now, how did we measure this? We asked people, would you paint the house of your boss if he asks so? Answer A, dear boss, go to hell. And you see he is the boss in the company, not outside, which is a sign of specificity. In a diffuse culture, yeah, it's my boss, but he's boss everywhere, so I need to help him. Have a look of people who said, dear boss, go to hell. So you see in Sweden and the Netherlands, 91% said, no way, I will not paint, and 9% are immigrants. You go down the line and you have China. Yeah, it's my boss, I need to help. Now, to show you the difficulty of this type of research, the most diffuse of all cultures is Japan. And you see here Japan in the middle, 71% said, no, we will not paint the house. So we interviewed the Japanese, we were surprised. And the Japanese said, our option was not in your questionnaire. I said, again? I said, yeah, in Japan, we would never wait till the boss asks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is more specific and this is more diffuse. Also interesting, uh, you see the Middle East, there uh, are quite some differences. Right? Um, again, have a look here. Now we said, and I do this on purpose, same database, but forget um, nationality. What industry are you working? Now, okay, we have faked a bit. This is 60, yeah? 67 to 99. But because of the size, 
uh, for us, and, and you don't have to memorize this, but it is industry you're working in, it is corporate culture, it is functional culture, it is national culture. But for me, what is important is what dilemma is on the table and how can we reconcile it. So my, this is your spread. Now let's have a look here. Open and direct, analyzing, easy contact, letter of contact, eh? versus polite, implicit, indirect. And this shows by easy contact and commitment, which is positive, eh? the, the, the peach and the coconut, and negative, very often seen as superficial and blunt, and hard to have contact, evasive, indirect. And that shows by, and I, I think, and I want to stop here for the break, is uh, the different styles of communication. You can recognize a coconut versus the peach. The peach is specific on the right-hand side. They start by making a point, right? And then gradually they show respect for the relationship. So it's a bit like, let me first give feedback and then make context. Diffuse cultures, and that's called high context cultures, start with context and then gradually make the point. The problem is that specific people stop listening in the middle. So they don't get the point. They don't wait for the sake where the point is made, etc. My advice, and this is a very practical advice to you, and you have so, who am I to say so? You, I, I'm sure many of you do that informally. But, but two, for, for this communication styles difference. Email, for example, is specific. Tone of voice and face-to-face -face is diffuse. Can I give you one advice? Do two things. Open communication channels. So if you write a lot of emails, for some, talk. Call them and say, by the way, I've sent you the email. This is what I meant. <laughs> that I love you. Yeah? But bloody hell, get it done. Yeah? And um, so open communication channels. Secondly, create as many informal moments you can. In project work, I know you're under pressure, but meetings like this, you don't have to do this every week. But once a year or twice a year makes a difference when you then have direct communication because you have seen the person. Right? If you are in, a, in an environment, especially with more diffuse cultures, have a dinner. And over dinner, speak about business. That's fine. Because privately, you can discuss everything. In public, half of the stuff is not discussed because loss of face and, and what have you. You know this, but for those who say, gee, it's good that you remind me of this. Right? Let's have a little break. What I'll do after the break is the following. I'll finish the model, three, three more steps, uh, short and sweet. Then we go into a method of dilemma reconciliation. That is, you will see on your, uh, it's not handed out yet, but you will get a dilemma sheet with six steps. And we will take one of your dilemmas that you at the table, just stay at the table, unless you hate your neighbor, but tell me in the break, OK? <laughs> we'll, we'll move you around, and I'll tell you what I said to the others. And, uh, and we'll go and then do it practical on your dilemmas rather than my dilemmas, OK? Hey, 10 minutes or 12 minutes again, Mark? Is that OK? 12 minutes? And we'll see you back, hopefully. <laughs>